There are seven billion of us in the world today. And we're facing some huge problems. Awareness doesn't reduce pollution or grow food. That takes doing. I'm Manoj Bhargav, the founder of Five Hour Energy. I realize we're making a lot of money. He has cracked the Forbes billionaire list. If you have wealth, it's a duty to help those who don't. You know he's trying to save the world, right? Yeah, well, that's happening over there. We're going to the invention shop, also known as stage two. It is the most well-funded playhouse for engineers you can possibly have. Our goal is to deliver products which can directly impact humanity. If you come up with something cool that's not useful, we don't do it. I have no interest. I don't want to be cool. I actually, I'm never going to be cool. <laughs> right now, I'm concentrating in three areas. Water, energy, and health. The drought has left its mark here. Some communities could soon run out of water entirely. China, India, Africa. Now, there's a lot of places around the world there's a shortage of water. This is the RAIN project. We're able to take unusable seawater and turn it into drinking water in a matter of minutes. This machine can do 1,000 gallons an hour. You create this barge, which has a lot of units on it. Put it a couple miles offshore, pipe the fresh water to land. If you have thousands of barges throughout the world, we can address ridiculous amounts of people. This is our program we call Free Electric. The idea here is really simple. A person uses a hybrid bicycle. You pedal for an hour, and you have electricity for 24 hours. Billions of people. This will allow them to have unlimited energy, pollution-free. That's everything. Stage 2 works on medical devices. We're working on a project called Renew. It's a product that enhances circulation. We squeeze blood from the legs back into the core body, so it acts almost like an auxiliary heart. Poor circulation is the basis of a lot of illness. It's not about treating disease, it's about preventing disease. If you don't think through it, you just put up more hospitals. Now, we're also doing that. <laughs> There's an old story about a blind man heading towards a well, and there's a guy who's watching. If the blind man falls into the well, who gets the blame? If you're watching something that you can prevent, you gotta do something. We'd like to change the world, make it better. It's a great experience to be with someone that could probably do it. Manoj is driven by the fact that work is never done. The world can be changed. It takes a crusader. My approach is make a difference in other people's lives, not just talk about it. Let's do stuff. This project is going to drive me crazy. Are you already crazy enough? <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Thank you for coming here. As you'll notice, I'm not Larry Brilliant, um, but I am Shara Wudun, and I'm uh, taking um, the place of Larry because he couldn't make it today. And I'm really delighted to be able to talk to Manoj Bargav. And um, I think they called me in because I've written before about Nicki Minaj, and they thought that maybe I knew something about Manoj. What is this with your name? Thanks a lot. Well, is it a common name, Manoj? Manoj is common in India, but I don't think it's the same name. Yeah, okay, all right. You don't have a soul sister in, who's from Trinidad? I don't know. Okay, so tell us about your background um, in India, because you grew up fairly poor, uh, in a, right? In, you grew up fairly rich. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background in India? Well, uh, we weren't really wealthy or anything, but we were probably upper middle class. Uh, my background is really, as I said to you before, is not really all that interesting. Uh, we grew up in India. I grew up in India, and then um, when I was 14, we moved to the United States. My father was doing his PhD in, at Wharton School, and we were all students, you know. And then um, after that, I um, I went to school at this this. Fancy school gave me a scholarship, so I went to a, a, a prep school. Uh, we didn't have any money, so they provided the entire scholarship. 
and then I did Princeton for one year, and um, I know you're a trustee over there, so. Uh, and then after I thought. Wait a second, why did you only go for one year? Well, I think somebody at Princeton asked me the same question. I said, look, it's not because Princeton was bad or anything, but even four years is arbitrary. Why not five? I thought it was worth one. <laughs> so I did one. Well, it was a good one, but it was just worth one. I have a friend in a kind of high place. If you ever uh, you know, want to think about you know, going back, I can put you in touch. Not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen, really? Mm. That's too bad. So um, then you left Princeton, and you were like a taxi driver. You were, did construction jobs. Is that not true? I, after I left Princeton, I, I went to, I, basically, I became a monk for 12 years. Uh, and we did, you know, um, uh, you know, monk isn't what most people think. It's not a hairstyle. You know, it's, it's, you still work. You still do things. And so I did that. That was my teaching. That's where I learned pretty much. That was my education. That's how I learned how to, work, how to think. Uh, it was much more of a fundamental education than you would get at a fancy school. So you went straight from Princeton to India? That's right. Okay. And what kind of things did you learn there about thinking that you didn't get from college? Well, first of all, you know, colleges and universities tend to always go towards the more complicated. In other words, how can I even, you know, in other words, if you have professors, they don't write papers about simple. They write about complicated, you know, uh, complex ideas and so on. What we were taught is how do you, how do you find out the simple of stuff? What's the basis of all things? What's, we head towards the simple rather than the complicated. And basically, if you understand the simple, you understand a lot of everything rather than uh, complicated also has unintended consequences where simple doesn't. That's why even if you saw the bike or some of the other products, they were really simple things. They're not, you know, nobody's going to get uh, get published for it. Nobody's going to get, uh, you know, accolades from their peers for it. They're just useful. So we did things that were simple and they were useful. Instead of, how do I get people to respect me? I, I, you know, I don't really care. But did you spend all your time inside the monastery, or did you also tour many poor parts of India? Or no, I went. We went to a lot of places, but. Look, that was just part of my education. Can we kind of move on? <laughs> I really don't want to talk about it. Well, OK. One last question on that. What did you take from that that you brought into your current, current world? The education. The phase? Right. The education really is a discipline. Um, for example, it's a different way of thinking. You know, one of the things I said, I think, one time is that the way we run a business, I run a business, is basically if you bring me something, the question is, is it useful, right? And if it's not, I mean, I, I said this in a speech, it's, if it's not useful, it better be entertaining. And if it's not useful or entertaining, there's only one thing left, which is it's useless. So if you look at things in a simple way, how many things that you do are not very useful? I mean, you come to this conference every year, has there been something useful you got out of it? Or you come here because you came here last year? So every project, everything we do is based on thinking through it and saying, why am I doing this? Whether it's your life, whether it's business, it's really the same way. Every task that you do, it's really broken down into just those three, th three four things. And so, so that kind of thinking process. And so did that kind of thinking process help you um, think about five-hour energy drink? Uh, look, we, how did we, that come about? Well, we ended up with one of the largest uh, consumer products in the world. And you know, in our company, besides the plant, which is like 300 people, we have 75 people. It's, uh, it's multi-billion dollars and it's 75 people because we don't make things complicated. I mean, there's really not that much work. But we don't have all of these complicated MBA speak nonsense. You know, we just go right to the point and say, if isn't going to do something for the business, why are you doing it? I mean, you, as you know, most of the people here are probably in corporations and such. You have meetings about what you're going to have meetings about, right? Or things that eventually everybody knows that there's no point to it. So we just kind of cut through that. 
So I'm curious, do you sort of favor not hiring MBAs? Well, I do ask them a question. I said, how are you going to get over it? That would be my question to an MBA. Because an MBA is not an education, it's just schooling. Education comes after that. Okay. And if you just think that that's your education, you're going to mess it up. Right. So I just want to ask you a little bit more about five-hour uh, energy drink. I mean, uh, how, how many times a day do you drink it? I probably drink four or five a week. Oh, four or five. Okay. So less than once a day. So, right. and, and you time it. And how did you come up with five hours? <laughs> Well, actually, you can kind of tell it wasn't done by a marketing guy. It's sort of it's suggestive of, of what it does, right? Otherwise, it would be called zip or zap or something. I don't know. You have one second to tell the consumer what you're about. And that's what it did. It's not, a, it's not something for, it's not a cool product. You know, it's not like, OK, I'm going to have it hold it up and tell everybody this is what I'm drinking. No, it's functional. It's basically, you know, you're two in the afternoon and you're getting tired. You got all day left. So that's who takes it. Our customers are basically have long hours. So it's really big on Wall Street, really big in Los Angeles in the entertainment industry because they got long hours. It's people who work for a living. And did you actually time uh, the amount of, you know, time it worked out to be five hours that the, the drink lasts? It's about between five and six. We did a study. And that's where it came out at. OK, so you would have called it six hour if, uh, if you could get that, get that to six hours? Well, you want to, I mean, that's getting right to the details. But it, it was, uh, that's where it averaged. Uh, so we went with that. So um, what have you taken from that experience uh, at Five Hour? Obviously, you're still running, running that company. Uh, what have you taken from there into this work now that you're doing in, I don't know what you call it. Do you call it philanthropy? Do you call it impact investment? Do you call it, what do you call it? Well, the approach is the same. You just think through the problems. I mean, we made a lot of mistakes. For example, after we made, I made, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, we said, okay, let's start giving it out to people who need it. Because my lifestyle is not that fancy. Uh, this is in India, or is this is no? This is here. This is here. here in the US. And so we gave money out, and then found out that it wasn't really doing that much. There was not nonprofits are not very efficient. Uh, either the, you know half of them swipe it, the other half so much overhead, and they're really not focused on what they get done. They're more focused on how much money they raise. So we, after a few years of this, I, you know, then I actually went down, and in, in through that time, I actually visited people that really do need help, right? And then I figured out, oh my God, you know, what's really needed is something we don't, none of us understand. And it's so simple because we all need it. I mean, I, I went down and when I finally realized, what does somebody who doesn't have resources, who's poor, what do they need, right? That's the question. That should be the basic question, right? And in my arrogance, I didn't get the answer. And when I went down there, I realized it was such a simple answer. They just want to make a living and take care of their families. It's exactly the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. right? And so what are we doing? Are we helping them do that, or are we not? So then I realized the only thing that was true amongst those who are wealthy is that we got all of our money, all of our wealth from the Industrial Revolution. We have electricity, and from which everything else stems. And so I said, OK, we're going to, I need to figure out how to get electricity to a billion people. Now, that sounds nuts, but the problem is we found out that everybody was hoping that they would come up with an answer, except that everybody was saying they were going to come up with an answer. There was no they. So we said, all right, we're going to do it. And so then we came up with something. And we have a, a bunch of other things for health and water as well. But we came up with something that if you paddle for an hour, you have electricity for 24 hours. OK. And that's that. All right, so shall we go to that? Um, has anybody been wondering what this is here? Go ahead. 
This is the bicycle. Anybody want to try it? <laughs> Come on up. No? OK, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> OK, now what is supposed to, how do you know that I'm actually going to be? Um, Just paddle and see. And um, that, slow, fast, oh, I, this? Oh, this whole thing lights up. Oh, I see, OK. Um, and then, if and I, then that lights up. If I go too slowly, I'm not doing anything. Right. So there's a point. There's a medium pace. And at that point, what it does is you pedal for an hour, and, and the person will have electricity for 24 hours. Huh. It's good exercise. Anybody want to try it? <laughs> right. Please. Um, no, that's really cool. Um, and I was wondering whether or not if you could compress the pedaling into like five minutes worth of work or 10 minutes, then you get, no. or you get 12 hours instead? <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, when we went out with that, a lot of really interesting things happened. Uh, I actually went to India and I did a 11 hours of interviews you know, with the media. And the whole place, the whole country from north to south, east to west, Everybody, you know, it was just thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who wanted it. Because their view was, for about 75% of the population, they have electricity two, three hours a day. Right. OK. So with this, and they get a big bill. Right. And, and so what kind of places are you talking about in India? Rural, small towns. Like really far away from the cities? No, it doesn't matter. I mean, even in cities, they have rolling outages. They get three hours a day. Most of the cities, except for the really big cities, the six, seven really big cities, which, which is only 10, 15% of the population, everywhere else they were rolling outages. And so you never knew when you had electricity, when you need it. There were businesses that would go, couldn't make a living because they didn't have electricity. So when we came out with this and we sent it out, uh, we did some tests, sent it out to villages, uh, just a few. We found amazing things happen. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a widow with three children, and she uh, little children, so she was busy all day. And then now, with this, in the evening and into the night, she would pedal, she would, she would have light, and she would be sewing, and she'd make five bucks a day, which was enough to feed her family um, and take care of everything. Right? And we found out that so many people were making a living off that. There was a carpenter who could work at night and finish his job. There was a lady with a shop the size of this chair, twice this chair. And she could open up in the evening because she had light. Well, I mean, if she had such a small shop, where is she going to put the bicycle to? No, it's not the bike. What she did was charge the, we provide a little lamp. I see. And so she charged that lamp and, and she could we carry it. In. I see. We also found out in the mountains that if you had no light and that we got, we, we talked to the people and it was basically they couldn't go out of, the, out of their house. Because it's dangerous. If you go outside in the mountains without light, you know, there's a chance you may hurt yourself. Right, right. And so all of a sudden, it became an enabler for them to actually get out of the house. Amazing. And just amazing things that, think about it. If you were at home and there were no lights, you would just be sitting in the dark in the evening. Right, right. So I could see a subsidiary business where someone actually has a kiosk that will just charge batteries, charge, you know, and then right. people will take them away, and that person just sits there all day doing that and charges for Well, like, yeah, there, a there's a, if you, I mean, it's $250, and, uh, and I did research over there and found out that most everybody can afford it. But on the other hand, if they can't, let's say a village only has one of these, right. but has several batteries. But then they can just Right. Run. That one guy becomes the utility. He just comes in. They themselves pedal it, charge their battery, and go home. Okay. And so this will give you know, a billion to two billion people electricity and bring them into the age. We also sent one to a school. All of a sudden, you know, they were on the internet. Because before that, I mean, a school without electricity is a library without books. Right, you, right, you need it. You can't access anything. Right, right. You know, so it's going to change. Uh, it's probably going to be the largest change in what I call the unlucky half of the world. Right. Um, so you mentioned $250. Mm -hmm. So you're selling them. Tell me about how you came, around, came to that price and why you're selling it uh, sure. at that price instead of giving them away. Right. Or, you know. Well, we have a new model. Um, 
what I've found out working with a lot of nonprofits and opening one is that nonprofits are terrible in efficiency. You know, they, because there's nobody rewarded for actually producing anything, that the, the mindset becomes, okay, our job really is to raise money. You know? And all the, the, the senior people are there to raise money. So there's, it was t totally inefficient. And obviously, we I wasn't doing this to make, a, make money. So what we came up with was an interesting model, which is not a nonprofit and not a profit. It's a zero profit. So we have the efficiency of a for-profit, but we don't make any money. So what we do is subsidize it. Sometimes some places will charge more if they can afford it, and then give a, subsidize to other places. So the model is really something that, you know, and also we did something really fairly clever on the distribution side, because you have to get it out to everywhere. Well, how do you do that? Nobody's motivated to do it. Nobody's making any money. No, it's not going to get out there. So we've made it so now that the dealers make almost no money on the basic bike. So uh, our cost is basically deliver $250. Okay. So the dealer also sells it for maybe makes five, ten bucks on it. Okay. But if the, the person who bought it can afford more things, like they want a TV, they want additional lamps, they want whatever, they can then make margins on that. Right, but that's, is that something that you sell to no. them? Or, no, it's just to, to the kiosk or whoever well, sells it. Well, we have to make the dealers make right. money, otherwise they're right. not going to take right. our product. Right. So the way we did it is, okay, you don't make any money on our product, but you make all the money on the auxiliaries, accessories, so that they have motivation to go out there and pedal this thing. I mean, not, wasn't meant as a pun. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they... They actually um, right. uh, will find other ways to make money off of this as well. I mean, certainly any TV can plug into the battery, right? You've got just, right. you know, um, a way for any appliance, a stove, a refrigerator. And, I, I, yeah. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, basically it'll do cell phones, fans, lights, computers, TVs, uh, small equipment. I mean, people are doing, you know, all of a sudden sewing machines and tons of small scale industry. Um, but it's not going to do a refrigerator, it's not going to do an air conditioner, it's not going to do most things that we think are just plug and put the, flip the switch. Uh, but they don't even have that right. at this right. point. So bringing them a livelihood is the main issue, and bringing them education, because now they're on the internet, they can learn all kinds of stuff. So um, in the rural areas, uh, certainly, there is talk about you know, bringing solar energy, also microgrid. Why would this be, or how does this compare to those alternatives? Solar doesn't work. I mean, solar, you know, to me is, is uh, we've really looked into it, and it's nonsense. Because it doesn't take into account the environment. Right? We had, uh, I talked to these people who were in the energy ministry, and they told me about solar. Uh, and they'd taken this large area and put solar everywhere. And he says, after we finished, a few days later, it hailed. There was a hailstorm. And the guy was laughing because he says, it was all over. Everything was destroyed. Oh, it destroyed them. Right? So, and then, you know, in some places, especially in India, in India there are like, there's probably 50 million monkeys. Right? And monkeys love shiny stuff. So all of a sudden, you have kids throwing rocks. You know, it really didn't belong in there. And what happened is, it, after a while, it became a fancy tray or a table. You know, it's, it really doesn't, nobody's going to come to fix it. You need a PhD to fix the solar. This one, any mechanic that can fix a bike can pretty much fix this. Every small town can fix an alternator. Right. So it's forever. That's the difference, is they didn't think through the issue, right? Also, solar can get you a small amount during the day if it's not cloudy and if it's not raining and so on. But you can't say, okay, I need more. Well, with this, if you're making a living, do two hours, do three hours. Right. And so, can it store? It can store. And it can store the energy. So it, there's really no comparison. Uh, uh, solar's not there yet. I mean, people are saying, yes, it'll pay back in 20 years. Well, it's not going to last 20 years. Right. You know, okay. Nobody's thought through that yet. And what about wind? That same problem. It's expensive. It's uh, sporadic. It's only in a few places, and it's not affordable by each person. Uh, the the problem with with community 
wind is if nobody owns it, then nobody takes care of it. Right? Who's, and who's going to fix it? If it goes bad, you think some guy in a village is going to fix a you know, wind turbine? and uh, There's no way to fix. Well, but you, if it become, belongs to the community, then the community must uh, provide the maintenance. The, the problem is when something belongs to everyone, nobody's responsible, which means no one fixes it. And they expect the government to do it, and the government never comes back. Okay. So it's, if you think through it, it needs to be independent. It needs to be there. And the an interesting part happened is like, uh, it's like owning your own home, right? You own your own home, you don't pay rent. And, in, and I, know, I know in the old style, they really care about that. You know, I own my own home. Well, we were shocked because then they started looking at this. They're saying, we own our own electricity. Because if you're paying monthly, you're renting electricity. Right. Right? If you own it, that's it. I pay one time, I'm done forever. I own my own electricity. I can make as much as I want. Right. And so it became uh, something that totally changed the way people perceived electricity. Well, you also were talking about community size, large size, large scale solar. There's also household si size solar powered batteries. So why, I mean, how do those compare to, to this? Well, it's, just, it's the same thing in, in, in a house. I was actually thinking more of house level solar is that you can't fix it. And it's not, I mean, I've talked to the best guys in solar in the world, and their view was it's not ready for house. It's not, I mean, it's okay in industry because you have maintenance people, you have things people get, we can fix stuff. In the house, or certainly in the village out there, it's not ready because it requires maintenance. And nobody knows how to maintain one of these things. So uh, solar will get there someday, maybe, but it ain't there now. Hmm. And people are putting this up, and it's just nonsense. Right, right. So um, you have a number, number of other very interesting inventions, too. Can you talk about um, the water uh, and why you, just, why you chose, after electricity, I guess water was the next one, or did water come first? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, if you think about it, there's only two things we absolutely need. One is to make a living, and second is to be healthy. The rest is just entertainment. Right. Yeah, we, we need all of this fancy stuff. But really, those are the two things. For livelihood, you need electricity, because that goes to education. It goes to anything that you're going to do requires electricity. The same on the health side, you need clean water. Right? Most of the beds, more than 50% of the beds in hospitals worldwide are occupied by those gets, that get sick by bad water. Because a lot so, of if, world. Right. So if you're not doing water, right. you're not doing health. Yeah. You know, in, in at least half of the world. So water was the next big thing. In fact, we've got equipment now that can actually solve California's problem. Uh, we're going to be installing it sometime this the first one this year. Oh, I see. In the next few months. And where? Where? In uh, at this point, I'm not sure they would want me to say, but it's a university. Um, in California. In California. University is like a city, so right. they want to clean their water. And, and, and we have one, a system that's fairly amazing in the sense that the biggest cost of cleaning water, whether it's desalination or other water, is power, electricity. And we've figured out a device that would use no additional power. So California could solve its problem with no additional power requirement. So can you talk about how the current desalination uh, right. technology operates and how yours is different? Right. Okay. Because the, this, this sure. is very expensive. Yes. And yours is not. Well, right now, everybody is doing what's called reverse osmosis, RO. You have it in your house. You, you know, the big plants are really big RO system. Uh, what reverse osmosis is, is you have a screen, um, and then you shove water against it with high pressure Half the water that comes out is good. The other half is a waste stream. Incredibly expensive in terms of uh, um, the amount of energy it takes and the membranes, the, the screens, that you have to change every so often. And a huge plant. I mean, the last plant they put up in California took 15 years. Right? I don't think we have 15 years. Right? So ours is what every science guy said, you guys are nuts. You guys are all wrong. It can't be done which is distillation. 
right? Which is the older system of cleaning water, which is you boil water, you have steam, take it down to water again, it's clean. And the salt is left behind. The salt is left behind. So everybody said that just takes so much energy, it's just, it's just dumb, right? So what we did was, we, when you take water and you turn it into vapor, it takes energy. When the vapor goes back to water, it releases energy. Because energy, I'm a dropout, but I do know water, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed, right? The old physics one. And what we did was take the energy when it releases it and recycle it back to heating the water. How do you recycle it? It's through heat exchange. It's, it's, it, I don't understand, I'm not an engineer, I, I, but it's heat exchange. It's basically heat transfer. So you take it from there and you do it again. So what it did was make it, even if you used new electricity all the time, we were 30 to 40% less electricity, less power than the reverse system, reverse osmosis system. But we also did another tricky move, which was that the equipment is really tiny, right? So instead of, like, if you had computers, it would be like a, in the old days, they had supercomputers, you know, Cray computer, large-scale computers, right? And then they realized, no, no, no. The way to go is server farms, right? which so, is small, hundreds of them. So what we created was a really small unit, which you can turn on and off within minutes. Right? Like, how, how big is it? That would be? Um... It, it's, uh, it's probably smaller than this little stage. Oh, OK. Right? So the interesting part was, well, in the reverse osmosis systems, it's one big plant. It takes a couple of days to get it up and you know, then shut down. And you, know, you can't just turn it on and off. Well, ours is sort of more like a dishwasher. right? So you can turn it on, turn it off. So all of the energy that California produces in the daytime, it doesn't use at night. Right? So there's a lot of energy that's just wasted. The way we made it was you can take that energy, which is totally being wasted, and turn it into clean water. Oh, I see. So at night, while people right. are not using right. it, you actually can harness. How do you harness that energy? It's the well, it's just electricity from, from the grid. Yeah, from the grid. The problem is right now they have to have the grid up to what you use in the daytime. Then they and the and the utilities can't just shut down right. every eight hours and pick it back up because they have large turbines. Right. So all of that energy is being wasted and can be turned into fresh water. So we came up with a way that. You know, it's a, sort of a tricky move, but it would solve all of the problems. And so that's, that's our water. And then we have other water stuff. We've come up with stuff that'll take arsenic out of water in a lot of areas. We have... Um, Wait, so on this particular, uh, what do you call it, this water filter, the water desalinization? <coughs> what do you call it? We call it the rainmaker. The rainmaker. The reason is, it's, what we did was take mimic nature. What nature does is Rain. blows across the ocean, picks up vapor, brings it over land, drops it. Drops it. That's it. What, we, what my idea was in the very beginning when I told our engineers, I said, look, why can't we put nature in a box? Right? Why can't we do the same thing? So it's sort of nature. The thing we found, I found all the time is nature is almost always smarter than we are. Right? <laughs> yes. And to go against it is kind of dumb. To go with it and kind of mimic it is usually the right answer. Right. And so what we did with the twist was that we recycled the energy. Right. Now that's fascinating. So we call it the rainmaker. So um, first of all, are, what kind of approvals do you need to get uh, to operate that in here in the US? We really don't need any approvals. Now, we did have it tested. The uh, United States government has a facility in New Mexico that tests uh, new water cleaning devices. And uh, it's kind of a funny story because uh, they have three ponds. Um, they're not very creative, so it's pond one, pond two, and pond three. Right? Those are the names of the ponds. Pond one is sort of brackish water. P pond two is more sal uh, salt. Pond three is sludge. Oh. Right? Nitrate, sulfates, lead, everything's in there. Right? So our guys took our equipment over there. And our guys are a little crazy. You know, They're not your normal engineers. Uh, and so they go. Nah, let's go pond three. And so we went straight to pond three. And we were able to take out 
uh, it became 40% better than drinking water requirements by the EPA. The sludge became the sludge. 40% better. Be better than Wow, the, that's amazing. And, and the, we talked to the guys there. He says, are you going to try Pond 2? He thought we tried Pond 1. So he says, nobody goes to Pond 3. Are you guys crazy? <laughs> so apparently we passed on Pond 3. So we had this certification by the, the DOD something lab that says, OK, we did this. So are you getting calls from India and China? We're, we haven't really announced it because I'm right now, I'm so, under so much pressure on this one right now because I've announced it uh, and now all over the world, everybody wants it. And so we're concentrating on getting production out the door. So what is your first, um, what is your, I guess, monthly production or daily production or? No, it isn't out yet. It'll be out probably you know, late June, early July. And so how, how many do you think you'll make uh, in the first month? Well. Probably only a few hundred, but uh, the, it's slated for one of the plants is slated for five thousand a day. Oh wow! Uh, plants in India. In, in one plant in India, one in Singapore. Oh, I see. Uh, and we're going to make a few here because I think people here want it, but they want different things. I mean, I have people come in to, can I put a calorie counter on? <laughs> no, it's not meant for that, guys. But you know, probably we'll do it. Uh, now, why Singapore? Could you go into Southeast Asia or, or right. why? Okay. Southeast Asia. Also, Singapore is the place where you can get things done faster than anywhere in the world. Right. right? So we put it on there, and we're going to supply India. And then when India is up, then we'll supply, you know, there's, we have from everywhere, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, everybody is, well, is China, all over it. China yeah, certainly China. would be very interested in that. Right. I just don't want to tell everybody because the problem is then I, I got to make it. Well, you know, that's the once problem. You've so come up with a plant, that's not so hard. Right. That's, that was the hard part, to make it really simple. What you saw in there in the film versus this, it's one-third the weight, and it's more efficient than that one. Okay. So we had to really get it to a point where it's so simple, there's nothing left to do. And in terms of breakability? In terms of breakability, in terms of manufacturing, um, there's nothing in here. I mean, it's basically a bicycle, so you can get the bicycle parts and fix it. There's an alternator, which anybody can rewind. It's a car battery. Anybody can do it. So what are you going to do if, uh, with copycats? Well, everybody asks me this question. Aren't you worried people are going to copy it? I said, look, I don't care if they copy it. Just copy it well. Don't mess it up. So if you want to copy it well, we will send you prints. We will train you. Oh, interesting. Because I'm not making, it's not like I'm making money off this. Right. There's no right. money anyway. Right. So I mean, I've got people from a lot of countries that say we would like to make it. And we're saying, OK. Oh. We, will, you know, we made one in the United States. So you can come here. We'll train you. We will then give you, or sell you, the, the sort of the, the line, the factory line. Oh, interesting. And so you can just make it yourself. Well, that's, that's very interesting. So you really are making it. It's basically um, open, that's right. open season. So that's, right. that's great. Back on the water, mm -hmm. what does the industry think of you in terms of these are companies that have been spending, that spent decades trying to come up with a, the best and cheapest uh, desalinization you know, machine, and they've been trying to get the cost down for a long time. What do they think of you? I don't really stay in touch. Um, I really don't care. And so I, I, it's not something that I spend any time on. Um, what competition? You know, I'm not, they're not competition. If you can do it, you do it. You know, that's fine. I, I don't. I mean, look, without water, you're going to have a world where a few billion people are going to die, right? So if anybody else can come up with something better, awesome. It's not competition because it's, it's not about. I already have enough money. I really don't. You know, in my lifestyle, you know, my. My wife will go to J.C. Penney and get five dollars off, and she's have made her day. You know, so we're not really that fancy, you know, uh, people. So I, I, you know, money is not the the thing. Is what can we do that's really great? What can we do that's really useful? And so that's what we're after. If somebody else makes it something better, we'll help them. It's not about. Uh, there's only so much money you could use. Right. No, that's that's true. Um, but they haven't approached you or, you know, have they? <laughs> no. Okay. It's, it's funny. Everybody has a little agenda, you know. Uh, I went to this thing called the government, the U.S. government put together this thing on water. Right? So I said, sure. They want me to speak. So I said, sure, I'll go. Nobody was interested. 
they all were interested in only one thing. What's my budget? Next year, I have a budget to make. Nobody cared about really the water and how well it worked or did it work or didn't it work. Not a single question. It was all about everybody has their, they, look, I understand. They got to make a living, you know, people and bureaucrats and so on. So what I did understand, which was that no problem. I'm going to do it myself. It's not a, I mean, to me, it's like, okay, it's a challenge. Bring it. Let's see what you got. So we're... we're my thought right now is we're coming up with stuff that we will we'll make our own money to make it happen. We have some of the largest technologies in medicine coming up. Yes, I want to hear, can you talk about one of them, the um, sure. enhanced circulation? Enhanced circulation is one, but the one that's the most commercial is actually most people don't understand medicine in the sense that where's the problem, right? Everybody tells you that the cure or treatment is the biggest issue, that we should get more treatments and more cures. Well, it's actually not true. The biggest problem isn't treatments or cures that we don't have enough of. The biggest problem is bad data, late data, and bad diagnosis. Okay. So, for example, if you found out, you know, uh, I talked to this uh, professor, big professor, and she asked me a question. Is what is the gestation period of cancer, right? I don't know. Look, I'm a dropout. I don't know anything. So I, I, uh, she said eight to ten years. I had no idea. And well, when do we find out about it? Six months before you're going to drop dead. Right? So the idea is if you can find out years ahead. Right. So we've come up with some really interesting things that will tell you ahead of time. Wow. And also, you know, there's things that people don't, really don't know. For example, when a doctor gives you a diagnosis, right, he's supposed to make that diagnosis based on a change in your health. Your heartbeat was this, now it's this. What actually happens is he has no idea what your heartbeat was or what other conditions were. He, you go to the hospital and he says, oh, heartbeat's this, oh, it's too high. Uh, give him That's wrong diagnosis. We found out that based on the echo of your heart, echocardiogram, that the number of, if there was an intervention required, that the error rate was higher than 50%. Scares the hell out of you. Hmm. Most heart operations or interventions are based on the echo. And they shouldn't be. And they're, no, they should be. But, but they're misdiagnosed, you know, fit more than 50% of the time. Yeah. And so we work with some of the top guys in the world and came up with a way to look at the echo information and be more than 95% more than accurate. It's an algorithm that looks at the information and says, OK, this is what you should be doing. So we're finding that the data and diagnosis is, is amazing. We come up with a patch where it's this big, goes here. And for two weeks, it'll tell you your heart rate, your temperature, your blood pressure, hydration, respiration, and oxygen remotely. We'll send that information to a cloud. You can be released from the hospital, and you're being monitored. If you're really old, you can be monitored 24-7, and nobody's there. You know, you're being monitored remotely. But so the, those the, five things, four or five things, are enough to tell whether or not you, you need to go back into the hospital because you have heart disease. Right. They are. A lot of, for example, the largest problem, the largest cause of death is something called sepsis. Okay. There is a larger one, which is heart failure. but Heart failure is like everybody dies, so everybody heart fails. So that's not, it's not an accurate look. Sepsis is when you have mass infection. You know, your body's on fire, right? What this patch will do is, and actually the amazing part is, 25% of the ICU of the entire United States is patients with sepsis. Wow. That's a quarter of the old ICU. And what this device will tell you, and also every hour that you're late, you have a chance of your increased mortality rate increases by 7.5%. So four hours later, there's 12 doctors in the room looking at organ failure of everything. Right? What this device will do is tell the hospital, before you even know anything is wrong, that there's a problem. Bring them in. And then they can hit you with all the antibiotics, and, and you don't. You know, you're fine. 
And you can also do this for eight years in advance for cancer. Well, there's things that are Obviously. putting on. I mean, we have a chassis. We're putting in all these sensors, which will tell what have you got. Um, for example, we'll be able to, for, for at least these six things for right now, is, I mean, I haven't, you know, it's really bad, but I haven't been, had a physical in probably 15 years. <laughs> I just well, don't you go. you have it all in your own laboratory. Right. But there's a lot of us who are kind of like, eh, it's going to take half a day. I don't want to go. With this, you are at the office, you put it on, and the information is to the doctor, to, in, your, in the cloud, right forever right. there, for everyone. Right. And there's takes one minute to put it on, and it stays on for a week, and then you take it off. And, and, and then the doctor knows, well, for example, I'll give you an example. Here's the funny part. Let's say your heartbeat, you, you went to the doctor and, and, and you had a problem. Your heart rate is 85. He goes, oh, he's got heart rate is high. What he doesn't know is that your heart rate was always 85. Right. So he has no baseline to Unless compare it with. doctor that you see all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and he, does, he has no idea. So he, then he gives you medicine for, oh, yeah, you got a problem. Or the other way around, he says, oh, you know, his heart rate is um, uh, 75. No, it's normal. Well, it was always 55. Yeah. So they have a problem. The doctor had no idea. There's so many things like that that affect you. Right. Uh, for example, we can then monitor all the kids with, with sports. Right. 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 They're dropping dead because of issues here. Well, this can tell. Right. Um, no, that's interesting. Well, we're going to go to questions in just uh, one minute. I just want to ask one more question beforehand. So please think about your questions. Um, tell me about your philosophy about philanthropy because it you seem to have a different, slightly different from kind of what the mainstream right. uh, uh, philanthropy view is. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it first starts, philanthropy should be regarded in my view like you would if you had a business, right? You have customers and you look at what do they need. And what it has become is, well, I want to do this. Well, wait a minute, is it about the customer or is it about you? That's the biggest, one of the biggest problem is it becomes about what, what am I passionate about? No, no, no. It's not about you. It's about them. Right? So that's the first part. And then the attitude is we're going to help these poor people out. Right? So the attitude isn't one of like, okay, you're down there. We're going to help you. you know, we're, we're big shots. We're going to help you. The attitude really should be we're here to serve you like a customer. So you're above us. Right? And the customer is always above you. So that shift needs to happen in order to then find out. This is sort of fundamental thinking. Then you say, then you respect those you serve, and then you find out what do they need. Otherwise, you give them toilets. Right. Right. You say, oh, you're starving. Let me give you a toilet. Well, that's not helping. Yeah. You know. So it's it's uh, first the shift has to be that we're not better. I mean, I chose to call the people unlucky half of the world. Because to call them poor is condescending, you know? Third world, you know, it's so condescending. As if somehow, because they're not as rich as you, they're less human, right? That's interesting. There's, there's 10,000 people that, uh, 20,000 people that commit su committed suicide last year because they didn't have water for their farming. Hmm. And the only thing that's reported is when a few rich people die. Right. Right. Right? So there's a, there's a shift that has to be there that we're here to serve you. And what, what I see is everywhere is we only talk about the rich half. Right? That's the only relevant people. And, and I think the only way you can do philanthropy is if you change that. Right. And if you're not, then you're, you, know, you want to put your name on a building. You want to give some fancy rich university another bunch of money. Awesome. And to me, it's not philanthropy. It's a nice hobby but it's not philanthropy. Right. Philanthropy means service to humanity, and service means to humanity means serving those who need it, right. not rich people. So um, I'm not going to be very popular. <laughs> so I'd like to turn to the audience. Are there any questions here? And I don't know, do we have a microphone? OK, great. So anybody have any questions over here? Can you state your name and stand up, please? Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Jennifer Doyle with Eco Upstart, and I'm just curious if you're planning to build a product that would accommodate for people with disabilities or the elderly. I can't imagine many of them would be able to use the pedals all day for, or for an hour at a time. And then one other thing too about the, the car battery, um, if you're producing about you know, 5,000 every day for an entire month, that's about 150,000. And in five to six years from now, they're gonna need to be recycled. So do you have a plan for that as well? Okay, first, first question, no, we're not doing a thing. Um, I've gotta pick where the largest problems are and go with that. There are a lot of really good things to be done out there. I agree, but I can't do it all. So we're sticking to those things which have the greatest impact on the largest part of humanity. And even the disability side, look, if a family has enough to eat, if you've really been down there, you'll find out what happens. Is if family doesn't have enough to eat, they throw out the disabled. They say, okay, we can't, here, get out. So it really starts at making a living. If the family's making a living, if they have food, if they have, you know, they're not nasty people, it's just they, if you walk in their shoes, you realize that they need that to take care of the other family members that are disabled. So it's a, what we're providing is a fundamental, which is sort of below that, right? As far as batteries, I think we'll go out with this right now, but in the next few months, the, the idea is to change to lithium ion, for, for one, for sure. And you're right, that is a problem, and we, we intend to take it back and then get, look, the great part about where we're doing this is they don't throw anything away. Only, I mean, you, know, you got United States, Japan, and Europe. We have so much that we throw everything away. If you go to poor places, <laughs> if you think they're gonna throw a battery away just because it's used up, never gonna happen. <laughs> everything is recycled. That's interesting. Any other questions? Please, please, go ahead, right there. So just uh, a comment and then a question. On the solar piece, I know that uh, Amy Christensen, Christensen Global thank and the you. Sun Valley Institute, thanks, um, been working in energy and climate for about 20 years. And I know about 20 years ago, actually, some entrepreneurs started doing that solar home system deployment in India and Bangladesh. And I think they've learned a lot over the years. And now maintenance is routinely included, just so you know, it's, it's improved over the years. And MCOPA, where Generation Investment invested recently, they incorporate that into their system. So I'd push back a bit on that maintenance comment about solar. It's certainly okay. improved. But my question question is, um, on your system, what's, the, um, what's your business and, and deployment model? Do you have people in countries? Are you building businesses? The office is there? Are you creating subsidiaries? Are you just starting in India? What's the plan for distribution and expansion? Well, the plan is really simple. In India, we're going to build a plant and maybe several. Uh, basically, it'll be subcontracted. And what we're doing is a dealer network that is a business dealer network. So. But I think I said it before, was that they get very little margin. So it's really at cost, X factory, all the way to them. That's the cost and maybe 10 bucks more that they'll get for the basic unit. And then accessories is where they're gonna make all their money. Accessories means if the guy can afford it, if the family can afford a TV, charge them. We're, we have no problems with that. We don't provide that, but what we will do is only make dealers and stay with that price. As for worldwide, we've gotten a lot of calls as to people who want to make it themselves. And we are open to that. We've, uh, I think I talked about that before, is what we are doing is we bring them into the United States, show them a factory. And we can then transplant that, give them training and transplant it if they're worthwhile. A lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna start a business. Well, that's not gonna do it. If it's amateur hour, we're not gonna participate. If Somebody there that's credible, we'd be happy to help them um, get this going worldwide. And also, I mean, look, in business, basically, to plan years ahead is mostly silly. You find out the first things, you go out and see what the marketplace says, and then you make accordingly. Any other questions? A couple more questions? Please, here, in the front here. My name is Sharon Chandran. Um, I'm a really big fan. 
by the way. Oh, God. Um, I, I wanted to ask you how you decide on what you focus on, on um, how you decide on what problems to address specifically, and how you assemble the expertise in order to execute okay. those ideas. Good question. Well, I'm a little slow, so it took me a few years to figure it out. But I found out the fundamentals are basically of everything is electricity and water. If you have those, if you don't have that, nothing is going to work, right? And there's so many places that don't have it. So if you can just do that part, you just solve the problem of a billion people, right? Um, so there are other projects we're working on. We have an amazing one coming. We just finished field testing that you can, the farmers will be able to produce, uh, you know, uh, farming for using half the water and no urea. So they will actually make money, which is a huge area because it not only addresses livelihood, it also addresses water. So we look at fundamental things. You know, what's the basic thing? What's a human being need? I'm not, I have no interest in making toys for the rich. You know, but that's, like how that's, did you assemble the team? OK, to... that's the next step. I, I used to have a whole bunch of engineers, you know, and they'd all be typing. And I'm, I go back there, and I said, what are you guys doing? Every day I go back there, you're typing. When are you going to actually make stuff? So what we did was turn it upside down, because and then they had people on the shop floor who would maybe do a few things. So we said, look, I don't need people who type. I need people who can actually make stuff. So all of our guys are not fancy degreed engineers, but tinkerers, you know. And our, my, the head guy uh, uh, has a weird background. He holds the land speed record for a car, you know, on the salt flats. So he was the head engineer for that. So somebody who actually did something that was unique, you know, that's what we're looking for. And he asked me, what are you looking for? You know, so I said, I want people who in their garage do not have a car. They got stuff they're building, the stuff they've made. If you haven't actually made something, please don't apply. So we went back to the strength of the United States. The old days, people actually invented stuff they made, not sat on the computers and, and did just, now, there's some value in that. But what we've done is say, OK, those guys who do thermodynamic testing on the theoretical scale, those are the superior guys. And the actual guys who actually make stuff aren't. And nobody gives them credit, credit. And so we turn that upside down. And with 35, 40 guys, we're making more stuff that's useful. We made this, the water. We have several other products. With just a few people, we made amazing things where there are guys with thousands of PhDs running around. Mobs of PhDs don't do the job. It's a couple of guys who can execute, who can actually make something. The other part is, you know, you make a lot of cool stuff, but you don't make anything useful. And again, the other part, the last part is, who invents for the poor? Nobody. Why would you? They don't have any money. They take somebody crazy. So actually, you've got engineers who don't really have a specialty in agriculture. Um, but they just have a tinkering mind, and they're working in this agricultural technique that you, you're developing. In other words, they don't have a specialty necessarily. Uh, no, they actually, we, you know, for example, the person who found this technology and sort of made it in the agriculture side, uh, it's my son. Oh. Uh, he doesn't know anything about agriculture. Um, just went out, did the research, and then what we did was simplified things. And everybody always wants to make things so complicated. If you ask anybody natural agriculture, it's, oh, it takes two to three years. Well, we did it in 18 days. Wow. Right? So it's just making things simple that are really needed is what's going to change things. Not, you know, not the fancy. I've been to all the universities, and I, I, I'm, not that, you know, I'm not that impressed. They're, they're, they do a, most of everything is being done to make toys for the rich. OK. You know, everybody needs to make a living. Awesome. But it's not my customers. 
there is a, a group of people who do want to focus more on outcomes uh, and you know results in in philanthropy in the nonprofit world, and so I think that you would find some uh, sympathetic ears to the, your approach to this service philanthropy. No, I, I I don't mean to say that everybody is like that, but obviously there are some really good people, and we actually fund some of them. Um, so it's not like we we think that we're the only guys who can do anything, but. To me, if you're working on the wrong problem, it doesn't matter how good you are, right? If you're headed down the wrong road, you're never going to get there. Right, right, right. got it. So. Well, thank you very much, Manoj. It was wonderful. Let's give him a hand, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.